here is the boundary of the ethmoid bone. This little crest in the middle is the Cristagalli. So the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid is the flat surface around the Cristagalli. So if, if the Cristagalli is like a shark fin coming up out of the water, the surface of the water is the perpendicular plate. And the perpendicular plate has a bunch of holes in it. So those are the olfactory foramina. If we flip the skull and look, we can actually see the olfactory foramina through the other side. So you see how if you look at the top of the nasal cavity there, you can see a little light shining through these holes. That's where your olfactory nerves poke up through your skull and they synapse with your olfactory bulbs, which form the olfactory cranial nerve. Yes. Yeah, it's this, come on, I hit like a sweet spot of light, there we go, it's this right here. So it's a bony ridge in the middle of the ethmoid bone. Yes, the, foramen the olfactory foramina, and those olfactory foramina pass through the perpendicular plate. All right, and then the sinuses or air cells, those would only be visible in a disarticulated ethmoid, so I will show you those another time. But basically, any sinus is just an air enclosed, an enclosed space in the skull that's full of air. So the ethmoid has lots of them. Okay, so let's look at the temporal bone, and then I will also get a disarticulated one. So the temporal bone is here. Oops. So it's on the side of your skull. It includes the mastoid process or mastoid part. Mastoid means breast-like. So whoever named this was like, that looks like a breast. And they named it so. So this is the mastoid process, which is an extension or projection that is vaguely breast-shaped. And then we have the external acoustic meatus right here. So remember, a meatus is an opening onto a tunnel. So the external acoustic meatus is the opening that gives entrance to the tunnel of your ear canal. Where is that? Right here. Oh. And I'll show you all this on a disarticulated one as well. So there's also a styloid process. Styloid means pen-like, but on this particular skull, it is broken off. So if it were here, it would be a very exaggerated tusk-like process, the very pointy that sticks down from right below the external acoustic meatus. So let's see who else might have one. They break off pretty easily because they're fragile. So sometimes you have to kind of get lucky. What about you? Okay, this one's pretty decent. So external acoustic meatus. Here, let's tilt that a little bit. There we go. External acoustic meatus. Here's the mastoid process. And then it's hard for you to see in the video, but that is a pointy spike-like projection that is the styloid process. So let's see if I can, there we go. So at that angle, you can see one in the foreground and one in the background. They're pointy. Those are styloid processes. All right. And then the other aspect of this, the temporal bone specifically, is the carotid canal, which is right here and right here. So this is basically just a hole that your carotid artery is going to pass through. All right, and so now I'm going to go grab the disarticulated temporal bone 
and we'll look at all the same stuff in a slightly different view. Okay, so now I've got my little assortment. There we are. Move some of these around a little bit. And go back to regular mode. There we go. Okay. So now we have a little closer of a view. Come on, where's that? There we go. Okay. So, mastoid process, external acoustic meatus. You can see the styloid process a lot more easily. It's right there. So that tusk-like appendage. This part right here, which I'll also show you from the superior view, this is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. It's called that because it reaches towards and articulates with the zygomatic bone. So sometimes a process is not named for the bone it's on. Sometimes a process is named for the bone it articulates with, and this is one of those cases. All right, so this border here would be the squamous suture if this were articulated. And remember I told you that squamous refers to the fact that it's thin and scale-like. Indeed, if I show you this edge of it, you'll see that it's very, very thin. It's n almost knife-like in its thinness. So that's the squamous part. And then there's the mastoid part, which is the part that has the mastoid process on it. And then on the inside here, this ridge-like area is the petrous part. Petrous means stony or rock-like. That's actually the densest bone in your body. So if those things aren't on your list, I'm just telling you for additional context so that you have other landmarks by which you can find the things you do need to know. Um, but also a fun fact about the petrous part, the reason it's the hardest bone in your body and the most dense is because your ear is in there. And if you want to be able to hear, you don't want anything to dampen the sound. So you know how in like an acoustic studio, you have like foam on the wall to absorb sound and keep the sound inside. If we had spongy bone by our ear apparatus, it would dampen the noise that we're trying to hear. So instead, the bone is super hard and very echoic, just like what granite hallway would be, just to make sure that as much sound as possible actually makes it to our hearing parts instead of being absorbed on the way. Yes, so here, I'll, I'll do it for comparison. I'll just give you, actually, let's do this, there we go. Come on, there we go. So it's this is right here. So on me, and I'm gonna hold it up to my, my head, it would be like so. So it forms part of your cheekbone. So where is this dialogue? You can't feel it because it's embedded in neck muscles, a bunch of muscles attached to it. That's why it's there. So you can definitely feel your mastoid process. It's that bump behind your ear. And you can definitely find your external acoustic meatus, but your siloid process is kind of buried in your neck meats. Is the, the thinness of the temporal bone why they say you get hit in your ear? It can be. The other aspect of getting hit in the temple is that your superficial temporal artery passes through that spot. And it's a big artery 
that's pretty close to your heart, so it's easy to bleed out through that one if you get an injury and nobody notices until it's too late. All right, so that was the temporal bone. So let's look at the sphenoid bone, which is an extra weird guy. So we're going to look down into the skull from the top, and then I'll show you a disarticulated sphenoid bone as well. So sphene means wedge-like. Not that you would be able to see that from this view. So this area here, including this little divot and these little points, those are the superficial or superior aspect of the sphenoid bone. So we have greater and lesser wings. So the greater wings are these broad ones here and here. And then the lesser wings are these little thin, sort of very narrow guys at the top here. So I'll show you these on the disarticulated one as well, where they're a little bit easier to see and understand. So greater wings, lesser wings here and here. And then you can see this space between the greater and lesser wings is the superior orbital fissure. A fissure is like a big crack, so that fits the bill, superior orbital fissure. All right, so if we go down the list, the next one is the hypophyseal fossa. So this is a little bit hard to show you in this view. What you'll see is that there's a dent in the middle of the sphenoid bone right here. Hypophyseal means hypophysis, which is another name for your pituitary gland. So the hypophyseal fossa is a little bony seat where your pituitary gland sits. So your pituitary gland is an endocrine gland that hangs off of your brain anteriorly, and it controls all the rest of your endocrine glands in your entire body. So this is its little house right here. And then here it is on the sphenoid bone as it sits in the skull. So this is the hypophyseal fossa here. So the other name for the bony structure that includes the hypophyseal fossa and also this little sticky uppy bit is called the cella tersica. So you might see that in your atlases as you're studying. Um, cella tersica means Turkish saddle because it resembles a little saddle where you would sit. Uh, yeah, so this hypophyseal fossa, another name for the it and the bone that surrounds it is called the cella tersica, which is on the etymology thingy on the list. I just have it covered up so you'll see it in a minute. But it means Turkish saddle because it resembles a Turkish saddle apparently. Right there. Yeah. So the way the sphenoid sits in your head is like this. So I'll show you that view here as well. It looks like a scary moth with big talons. So here's the moth's little feet where it comes down out of the sky and picks you up and carries you away. There's its little eyes. So the, just FYI, the little feet are called pterygoid processes. But what you need to worry about are the holes. So I showed, I showed you the superior orbital fissure, which are between the greater and lesser wings. So this big crack here. You can also see if I hold it that way, two holes that are sneakily right underneath the lesser wings at the top. So these are the optic canals. And what I'm going to do is get another pointer stick because the angle that they're at causes the sticks to cross. And that's actually what happens with your optic nerves too. They head backwards from your eyeballs separately, but 
right in the neighborhood of the pituitary gland, they cross over each other. And that's called the optic chiasm. So the shape of the optic canals reflects that anatomy. So if I were to ask you a question on the practical about this, I would probably stick either pipe cleaners or sticks like this through the canal so you could see where it went through and say, identify the opening indicated by the sticks. All right, so then we have various other foramina. So the foramen oval is probably the easiest one because it's shaped like an oval. So it's this little guy here and this little guy here. Right behind that is the foramen spinosum. Or excuse me, rotundum, my bad. I was thinking about it backwards. So it goes spinosum, oval, rotundum, like so. So these are nice because these are ones you can see individually on a, a bone because they pass through the entirety of the solid bone. Not all of the skull foramina are like that. Some of the skull foramina are formed by the confluence between a couple bones where there's a space left open. Those are the tricky ones because you'll be looking at a bone trying to find the hole in it when really it's part of the edge of the bone that makes up the hole and you can only see that hole if the entire skull is articulated. So, yeah. Um, it depends on what I want to show because there's some aspects of the sphenoid bone which are really hard to label on an articulated skull which are easier to tape or indicate unambiguously on the sphenoid by itself. So it kind of just depends on what I'm trying to ask and what I think is a fair way to ask it visually. All right. Yes. So another way to do this, and I'll show you two ways to do it actually. So if you go from the foramen magnum and you go find the sphenoid bone, which you can find by these little pterygoid processes, from the back it goes spinosum oval rotundum. So spinosum oval, and this one's extra big, rotundum. So spinosum, here, oval, rotundum. And because they're kind of all on a incline, you have to sort of tilt the bone to be able to see them. So if you, for example, if you're looking at this from the dead top, you can't really see the rotundum, you have to sort of tilt it like so. So another way to remember those, um, specifically the rotundum, is that if the Turkish saddle is indeed a saddle, and it'll make more sense if you're holding this, but if you imagine the saddle is a saddle for the moth, and there's a little fairy riding the moth, the foramen rotundum is where the fairy would put its little feet from the saddle into the stirrups, right there. It's very weird, especially when it's not articulated. Okay, so the sphenoid sinus is another one where you have to see that from a disarticulated or sagittally sectioned skull. So I will show you an example of it here. So to give you some context, this is the hypophyseal fossa. This is the sphenoid sinus. So right underneath the hypophyseal fossa is an air-filled space. You can only see it if we cut into it, though. So this is the sphenoid sinus right here. All right, mandible. This is your lower jaw. And fortunately, it's a little bit easier to decipher. So it looks a little bit more like you would expect. So let's have a gander at that. So on each side, 
we've got two processes. This one is the condylar process, and I think it's e pretty easy to see just visually that this is the one that articulates with the rest of your head and forms your temporomandibular joint. So if we look, we can verify that on this skull where I can see, come on, there we go, here and here. The condylar process fits into the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. So this forms your temporomandibular joint, which allows you to move your jaw up and down in that little socket. The anterior process on each side, so this one, this one, and this one, that is your coronoid process. So it's another coronoid process. I know you have a couple on your list in various locations. So it always means crown-like. <coughs> this one happens to be the coronoid process of the mandible. So the condylar process is the one that articulates with your temporal bone. The coronoid process attaches to various muscles of chewing and mastication to elevate your mandible and allow you to shut your mouth. All right, so now we have the mandibular foramen, which is on the inside, the medial aspect of the mandibular ramus here and here. So if you've ever had dental work done on the bottom of your jaw, like a molar needed a cavity filled or lower wisdom teeth came in, and your dentist had to anesthetize you. If they're trying to anesthetize the bottom jaw in one quadrant of your mouth, so the left or right side, they stick a big, huge, giant, scary needle way, 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 way back. And what they're doing is they're going for the nerve that enters this hole, because that's the one that supplies the lower teeth in one half of your mandible. So if we want to anesthetize those and make them not feel anything while they drill into your teeth, they have to hit this nerve. So th that's what they're going for. OK. Next page. So maxilla, this is your upper jaw. So it's easy to recognize because it has teeth in it. Even if it's dis disarticulated, it's pretty obvious what it is. So here's your upper teeth. Here's part of your nasal cavity. The only feature of the maxilla that you need to identify is the infraorbital foramen. So infra meaning beneath or below, and orbital meaning eye socket. So that's easy to find. It's right below the eye socket. So it's there or there. Here, let me move that. There we go. There and there. Infraorbital foramen. It's another nerve passage. So most of the holes that are in your skull are either for passage of a nerve or passage of a blood vessel. All right. So that's maxilla and infraorbital foramen. Um, the lacrimal bones, like I said, in most of the skulls that we have in here, let me just double check this one. Nope, missing two. The lacrimal bones tend to be missing, unfortunately. Um, so for example, on this skull, if you look into the orbit and you look at the medial wall, medial wall of the orbit, you'll see this big gaping hole here. That's not supposed to be there. The lacrimal bone is missing. So the lacrimal bone is right on the inside of your orbit, on either side of your nose. And the root word lacry means tears or to cry. The reason that bone is called the lacrimal bone is because it's got a groove and a hole in it. So if you look at your eyelid, your lower eyelid, really closely, what you'll see is a lacrimal punctum, which is like a little tiny hole in your eyelid. 
that hole is where tears get reabsorbed. So tears moisten your eyes all day, but if you're crying, you're making extra, right? So what you may have noticed is that if you're really crying hard, like doing a good old fashioned ugly cry, you'll get a runny nose. The reason for that is the lacrimal canal and the lacrimal sac dump into your nasal cavity and nothing is better that, at loosening mucus than salt water. So if you're dumping a bunch of salt water into your nasal cavity, it's going to loosen up all the mucus in your nasal cavity and you get a runny nose. So the lacrimal bone contains an obvious hole in it that is specifically for that purpose. So that one I would test you on a, one of the plastic modeled skulls because you can actually see it and you can see the hole. It's not just a big gaping missing place. Um, so I will grab actually right now a plastic skull just so we can make sure we see all of this stuff. So we'll do a little bit of a mixture here. 